lessons and develop the PowerPoints, and she couldn't be here today. And so we were supposed to team teach it, but I am here representing her also. And as Lisa was saying, all the lessons and materials that I'm covering today, plus some additional stuff, um, I didn't want to burn to a CD, so instead I got it saved to my SkyDrive account, and so I'll be able to link you to it through your email that you provided for me, and you'll be able to access everything. So you can open it in the SkyDrive and then download it to your computer, so you'll be able to see everything. Robbie Gray also um, has added drawings, bingo games, matching games, um, and uh, another little musical type game, and all that is included also. So, you need any of that. Um, one thing that she did was develop it into two separate lessons, and we use both. The first lesson, it focuses mostly on barrier island identification, the parts of an island, which you can see in the posters that I put on the back, the different plants and animals that occur on the different parts of the island, and then we focus on a matching game, and we hand the kids little cards, and um, I'll show you some examples of the cards. And this, I actually printed these out from the from the bingo game, so you can kind of use two things for one. Uh, some of you, there's some over here. And so these little cards, we hand them out to the kids, and then I hold up the picture, and for example, say take the blue crab to St. Simon's Island, and if they have the blue crab, then they'll come up here to this map that we have that you can get from the Coastal Georgia DNR, and they come and they find Cobby Island, and then they put the little picture off to the side where they're not covering up the island. And so when I was using paper format, I used this to hold up and say take the alligator to Tybee Island. Sometimes you have good time to go through a lot of them. Sometimes you only have time to go through a few of them. So you try to get a little bit in and some of the kids get upset because they don't get to come up, but you do the best you can. And so that's the first lesson is animal and plant identification and the matching game. You don't have to do this, but it's kind of a fun thing to do. I've done the bingo game as part of the Marine Science Club lesson um, just to have something to do with the bingo game. So if you had some extra time or a longer class, you could do something like that to help them learn how to identify those different plants and animals. Today I'm going to focus on the constructive and destructive forces, mainly because that's what's mostly covered in the barrier, um, the agri-science curriculum, and because it's what they get tested on in the CRCTs. So, first off, what is a barrier island? Or an example of a barrier island. Does anybody know? Tybee. Tybee. Tybee, that's right. Tybee is an example of a barrier island. Sapelo. Sapelo. Does anybody know the purpose of a barrier island? They protect. Protect the mainland. Protect the inland. They protect, protect the mainland or the inland. Inland, that's right. A barrier island is a narrow strip of land that lies parallel to the mainland. It's usually separated from the mainland by a bay, a lagoon, or a marsh, and in Georgia we have marsh, and it also protects the mainland from harsh conditions like what? Hurricanes. Sometimes the kids get a little extravagant, typhoons, tidal waves, things like that, um, waves, winds, and different um, situations. So Georgia has seven major barrier islands. There are Tybee Island, Wausau Island, Osceola Island, Sapelo, St. Simons, Jekyll, and Cumberland. And the reason why I call those major islands is because they're the oldest of the barrier islands. They've been around the longest, and they're also the largest. You'll see some smaller islands like Little Tybee or Little Cumberland or Sea Island, which you can get to through St. Simons Island. And they are younger islands and have developed through the constructive and destructive forces that we're talking about today. Today we're going to focus a lot on Jekyll Island because there is a 4-H center on Jekyll Island and also because it's the smallest of our barrier islands because it is greatly affected by erosion. It is only 7.5 miles long and about 2.5 miles wide, so if you were to walk the mile twice in PE class, you would have crossed Jekyll Island. So it's one of our smaller islands. So as I said, today we're going to talk about erosion. Does anybody know what erosion means? The wearing away. Wearing away, that's right. So erosion is the wearing away or gradually being worn away. And we see that on our barrier islands. And the sand is naturally moved around. A lot of times you'll have people on the beach and they'll have their beachfront homes. And some storms will come in and the waves will start eroding away that sand. And all of a sudden now they have oceanfront homes. Where they walk down the brick to the um, stairs and there's the water. 
and sometimes they maybe have that hotel there in the distance and the waves and the wind keeps on pulling the sand away and that hotel might not be there in the future. And the United States Geological Survey put together this video and you see this on the Weather Channel a lot too. What can happen if erosion greatly affects an area? So your house could be falling right there in the water. And I've seen this on the Weather Channel when rivers have overflowed their banks um, or when a hurricane has come in. So things that cause erosion include wind, waves, and some you may not have heard before called the longshore current. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So who wants a house on the top of that sea cliff? <laughs> you do. You want some rocks or some barriers underneath because the waves are continuing to pull out that sea cliff and your house will look just like the one in the video. So a lot of different things cause the erosion on our barrier islands, so we're going to talk about all of them together. Most of the sand from our barrier islands come in from the continental shelf that help build the barrier islands up and it causes sand moves in and out with the waves from the continental shelf. Now, the basics of erosion, it comes all the way from the North Georgia mountains through rivers and streams and breaks down into tiny pieces of sand. You see some of those tiny pieces of sand on our barrier island, but very little. Now, the wind blows the sand up and down, back and forth on the barrier islands. Sometimes the dunes are built up, sometimes the dunes are wore away, and then sometimes the sand is moved in a north to south direction and it helps add to the beach. And that's called beach accretion, or last year in fifth grade they changed the word to deposition. So now we use deposition. And the longshore current is a north to south direction, and it moves that sand in that pattern. So accretion, or deposition, is the opposite of erosion, so it is the building up. Have you ever been to your favorite beach vacation, and one year you see the boardwalk there, and you come back in a couple of years and that boardwalk's covered up with sand? Well, that was the building up, the accretion, and so it helps to cover up those steps. And that's caused by the longshore current. To describe the current, the waves hit the barrier islands in a northeastern direction, and think about a current at a um, lazy river at a water park. You ever seen those before? If you try to swim against them, what happens? It's tough. It's, it doesn't work for you, so it moves things very well. Where our longshore current moves the sand on a north to south direction on these islands because it flows right beside the islands. So it moves it from the north part of Osceola Island to the south part, from the south part of Osceola to the north part of St. Catharines. And it continues to go north to south, south to north, north to south, south to north. And continuing to change the shapes of these barrier islands. Now this is not a change that you're going to see overnight or maybe not even in five years, but 10, 20 years down the road, you might see a change in these barrier islands. Now, as I said, we're going to talk a lot about Jekyll Island because it is greatly affected by erosion. What city is associated with Jekyll Island? Brunswick. Brunswick, that's right. And if you've ever been to Brunswick, you've traveled over that huge Sydney Lanier Bridge. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? And what goes up under that big bridge? <coughs> water. And what floats in that water? Barges, barges, ships, that's right, and that's because Brunswick is a great shipping industry, and they bring in lots of cars and lots of equipment, and through this Brunswick River. Well, those large barges are big above the water, but they're also big underneath the water. So all the way back in 1906 and continuing to today, they came through and dug a channel at the Brunswick River so those ships could come through. And those ships are called dredging ships, and they scoop it up and they take it out to sea. Well, there's a problem with that. Remember the north to south, south to north, north to south, south to north? Well, when the sand from St. Simon's Island wants to come to Jekyll, what happens to it? It falls in that canal. They scoop it back up with those dredging ships, and they take it back out to sea. So Jekyll Island is a result of erosion with no accretion, and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller <coughs> on the north end. And for that reason, what used to be Maritime Climax Forest on Jekyll Island is now covered in waves and sand, and the trees are dead, and that's the reason why they call it Home Yard Beach, because Jekyll Island's continuing to wear away. And that's another reason why it's the smallest of our barrier islands. Now, the beach is dynamic and constantly changing, and 
Nature helps to protect the beach and also man comes in and tries to help out occasionally. The main force that protects it by nature is sand dunes. And that's the dunes of sand that we see at our barrier islands. All well, sand dunes start off as plant trash called marsh rack, W-R-A-C-K. Many of the marshes are filled with tall grass, smooth core grass called spartina. And that spartina sometimes dies and the tides come in sweep up that dead spartina, take it back out to the ocean, and it comes into our beaches with the waves. Sometimes in other areas you may see a lot of seaweed in this area. And it just sits there. And the sand starts building up on it, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, some plants grow through it, and then they just get covered up with more sand. But there's one plant that holds out among all other plants, and that is a sea oak. And a sea oak, every part of the sea oak is made to help hold that sand dune together. It has a tall stalk, like my tall hand, to help grab the sand, to hold on to it for it to come down onto the sand dune. It has long, flowy leaves to help scoop it up and hold it in there. And it has a deep root system, like my legs, to help hold it together. So if you were to pour that CO down of that sand dune, what would happen? You would have a big hole, and the sand dune would fall apart. So for that reason, sea oaks and sand dunes, because they protect the barrier islands, are fairly protected by law. That means you can have a stiff fine or get arrested if you were to pull that up. And that's why you see a lot of signs that say, keep off of the sand dunes. So those sea oaks, the deep root system you can see right here, help hold that sand dune together. Now, sometimes man comes in and does something about it. A big hurricane comes through and people's Formerly beachfront homes are now oceanfront homes, and they come in and they bring in a lot of sand and a lot of heavy equipment, and they add to the beach. They add to the level of the sand so the water cannot go over it. If they did not do that, then all these beachfront homes would be flooded as the waves continue to go through. So this is called beach renourishment. Last class, so they're seeing a lot of that on Tybee Island right now. They do that every three years on Tybee Island and keep the sand, the waves from coming over the beach area. And that's the part where you don't have sand dunes to protect the area. You have to do this every year or every three years. And you'll see here where there's water right next to the hotels and where they've done the beach renourishment. So you can see the difference. Another thing that man comes in and does occasionally is adds rocks or jetties. And what this does is it helps keep any more erosion from occurring. So on St. Simons Island, Hurricane Dora came through in 1964, where we normally don't get a direct hit, we did, and about knocked out all of St. Simons Island, especially that little shopping area where you go and get your Zuzu's ice cream now. And so they wanted to prevent that from happening again, so they added these rocks to help prevent it. And so environmentalists really don't like the beach renourishment or the rocks because they say it's interfering with what would normally happen with the environment, but the people that own property there really like it. So now we're going to do an experiment where you can see the effects of these waves, wind, and a longshore current. Now, when I do my experiment, I lay out um, a plastic matting, mainly because we had a brand new school and they had carpet, and we didn't want to get sand and water all over their carpet. You just have to tell the kids to be very careful with it. And then you talk about the two different beach environments. You have one beach environment, you have your um, Legos are representing your hotels and houses and your condos, and the sand is kind of what? Is there a pile of sand or is it flat? Kind of flat, okay? So that's our first beach environment. Then our second beach environment, we have our condos and our hotels and our houses, but what's different? You got sand is piled up, so there are sand dunes there. Now the lesson plan, it tells you to build sea oats, but don't do that. You can just pile it up real tall. So now we're going to ask for four volunteers to help hold our environments. So if I can get four volunteers. All right, thank you, April. I need three more. Thank you, Sonia. Nicole. One more. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to hold our environments. All right. So Sonia. You'll hold that in. April, you can hold this in. And y'all are going to go closer to the class. Alright. Uh, hold this in. And go class closer. Alright. So, we have 
our two environments and we're going to look at the effects. Now this is the hardest part with a classroom full of kids is they all want to rush up. So you have to remind them to stay on their bottoms and then you also remind the volunteers to hold their platters down a little low so that way everybody can see. So the first thing we're going to do is look at how wind affects our environment. Where you're seeing and you're getting your group to explain to the audience what's happening. So you all explain what's happening to the sand and what's happening to the hotels. Sands moving toward the hotel. Also moves out a little bit. Now the former fans that I had had a little bit of a cover on them. I couldn't find them. So, but these are foam, so they're not hurting anything. All right. So now let's look at the difference here. Do we see a difference? What's happening, Sonia? It kind of goes up to the pile. That's about it. it. Goes up to the pile, and that's about it. Okay. So that's the effect of wind on our barrier island. Now Robbie Gray does something a little different. She has everybody wear goggles and has a volunteer blow on the sand where they can actually see the sand affecting the hotel. So that's another option that you can do. Now we're going to look at the effects of water. And the first thing we're going to do is look at the waves. And the waves move kind of in a seesaw pattern. So you all practice your seesaw pattern. Gentle seesaw up. Yeah, there you go. Up and down. Like that. Y'all got a wave. See saw. Up and down. There we go. Up and down. All right. We'll work on that one later on. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is add some water. You get another kid volunteer to add some water. And first we're going to do our environment with no sand dunes. And usually the first time you have to add a little bit of extra water because it's going to moisturize the sand. Now very gently do your see saw and explain to the audience what's happening to the water and the sand. Not quite that gently. It's going to the hotel. Is some sand going out? Yeah, that means not going to last the time. Okay, sand's uh -oh. going in and out, going to the hotel. Okay, y'all can pause for a minute. Now let's look at our sand dune environment. Alright, y'all give it a try. Gentle seat saw. Alright, what's happening? Not getting to the hotel. It's going out. All right. So now we're going to try the longshore current, and the longshore current is more of a side to side because it's north to south. So y'all practice your side to side. All right. I'm going to add a little bit more water for y'all. All right. Side to side. Now explain to the audience what's happening. Well, the sand's moving. Let me give y'all a little bit. Seems to be accumulating. Mm -hmm. Okay, starting to wash up even further to the hotels. Now every class is sometimes different. The last class had a lot of accretion on that south end. This class you're seeing a little bit of that too. Now in a perfect world, all three of those things are happening at the same time. So I'm going to use my little tray here, but that little circular motion that Sonia and April were doing at the beginning, mm -hmm. try doing that again. Okay, this is representing all of it happening at the water. same time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give y'all some more water. Another storm. Okay. Oh. Do that circle. Now explain to the audience what's happening. We're making a mess. It's almost gone. The beach is gone. The hotels are flooded. We're, we're flooding a little bit. Uh, not as much as we're flooding. All right. All right. The hotels are starting to come to you, okay? Um, so let's give our volunteers a round of applause. Good job. All right. Now you can gently put your platters on your environments on the ground. Okay. And go back to your seat. And one thing that I do here is that I kind of review with them. Um, which one do you want your condo to be in? Do you want it to be in this one or the, this one? The far away one, okay? Now, thinking about each thing individually, which one do you think had the greatest effect? Raise your hand if you think the waves had the greatest effect. Raise your hand if you think the wind had the greatest effect. What about the longshore current? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All of them together? Yeah. Yeah, all of them together. So all those things happen. And then at the end of the lesson, there's lots of different things to review. What is longshore current? Why is Jekyll so small? There's a lot to do there. Now, after we adjourn the meeting, I come back and I get a, um, with every meeting, I have one bucket.
bucket for my dry sand. And I get my sand, you can do playground sand, you can do um, beach sand, or I had a personal connection at a golf course, so mine was sand trap sand. And I got a big bucket of it here that we use throughout the month. And then at the end of each meeting, we scoop up the wet sand and put it in one container, and then we add more dry sand if we have another club meeting to do. And then when we get back to the office, we kind of pour out any of the water that's with the wet sand, lay it out for it to dry, get more sand for the next club meeting. Um, water, you just replace it each month's meeting. The reason why I did the coverings, I think I've already covered this, but just to protect the pan, help it flow better on there. This one just didn't quite work as well for everybody to be able to see. And then the plastic's real convenient because at the end of the meeting, after you scooped up your sand, which would be kind of heavy by then meeting all this wet sand, um, you scoop up the plastic in kind of a in your hand format like this and go all the way around so it's in the center. And as long as you don't have any holes in your plastic, you're doing good. And then you take it outside and you can hold on to one side and let it fly. And that dries it and gets all the extra sand. And then you can take it back to your office or your house and lay it out and let it finish drying. I usually I don't use a whole big one like this. Usually I just use a half one. And we share a whole one um, to do our club meetings with. Fans you can get at Walmart, Lego blocks. I borrowed from a neighbor. So um, that's my five minute mark. Do we have any questions? Comments? Okay. Thank y'all so much. Um, I will definitely be sending you the information by the end of the week. And Lisa took some pictures of the experiment for me, so I'll try to add that in. That way, if you're a visual person, you can see that. The little cards, I use the bingo cards that are included in the lesson. Um, I cut those up to make the little cards. Okay? Thank y'all.